and waves. Peace, be still. Hear this, because even wind has ears. He, he spoke to the wind, peace. He said to the waves, be still, and they both responded. Watch this, wind has ears, water has ears, and both of them responded to his voice. Y'all are lost, all right. Uh, you, you, you remember this uh, runaway uh, prophet by the name of Jonah. Uh, that God uh, told him to go to Nineveh and to speak a word of redemption and transformation. And Jonah did not want his assignment, so he went in the opposite direction and went down to Lake Lanier. When he got down to Lake Lanier, uh, <laughs> you already know what's going to happen on that boat. He, uh, uh, he goes down to Lake Lanier. When he gets uh, down to Lake Lanier and pays the price, uh, to go in the opposite direction again a boisterous wind uh, comes out and uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, we find Jonah swallowed by a whale but not digested I, I said something that you missed uh, the, the, the whale swallowed it but couldn't digest it uh, it had him right in the pit of his stomach but couldn't break it down some of us get swallowed by grief, but you're never digested by it. Uh, is that you are engulfed, but it does not have the authority to break you down. And after three days, watch this, after three days, the Lord spoke to the whale. He did not speak to Jonah. He spoke to the whale and said, release him. All of a sudden, the whale becomes nauseous. And hearing the voice of God, the voice of God spoke to the whale, and the whale had to release Jonah. Why? Because everything God creates has ears. I got to ask you something. God has authority. Watch this over creeping things, over crawling things, over flying things. He even has authority over spirits. All right? You, you don't believe it? He asked the rhetorical question, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, oh, grave, where is your victory? Because death has ears. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Uh, the grave has ears. Now, the question I've got to ask you is mountains understand that at my voice, when I operate in faith, it's got to throw itself in the water. If wind understands that if it is moving topsy-turvy and hyperventilating, at the voice of faith, it's got to come to a screeching halt. A water is moving, watch this, and it is not even in time. It is not even time for the tide to come in. But when the voice of faith speaks, then the water has got to be in submission. A whale understands whatever it is that you're holding, it's got to be released when you hear my voice. I need you all to hear this very carefully. Death understands you can only have my son for three days, uh, but there's going to be an authority that is greater than death. No man takes my life. If I lay it down, then I got to pick it back up again. Watch this. Even the grave understands it has ears. And watch this. I have absolutely no instance in nature, whether it is a whale, whether it is wind, whether it is water, Everything that has ears responds to the voice of God but us. We are the only thing that has ears but does not respond to the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I'm trying to understand how it is that you are not responding to his voice. It's amazing, I can't even get past Genesis chapter one, verse number three, is that God steps into nothingness and says, let there be. Did y'all hear that? Nothing has ears. Y'all just miss what I just said. That, the, the earth is dark and is filled with nothing. And God says, let there be. And it was. Nothing heard it was supposed to be something. 
And when nothing heard it was supposed to be something, it then transformed into whatever he said it was going to be. If you were called while you were still in your mother's womb and you saying at 42 you don't know what you're supposed to be, it's because you were listening to what he said. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing is so critical. Uh, you remember there was a woman who has uh, an issue of blood. And according to Levitical law, she is not supposed to be in communion. She's not supposed to be in relationship. She is not supposed to even be in corporate worship. She's not supposed to be in corporate worship. But I want you to watch what Luke says about this woman uh, because she had never met our Savior before. The Bible says in the Gospels, she heard about Jesus and she thought to herself. She never thought about Jesus until she heard about him. She had not met him. But based off of what she heard about him, she started thinking about him. Ladies and gentlemen, I wonder what people's thoughts are about God based off of what they heard you say about him. Uh, now, I, 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 I wonder what she heard about him that she would think to herself something that does not align with church protocol. She thought to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I can be made whole. Where did this thought come from? The thought came from something she heard somebody else say. Watch this on a rumor. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Faith can be developed off of a rumor with no evidence. God, I can't hear nobody. That's why the enemy don't want you talking about God because it will make people who never came to church stop thinking to themselves. I wonder if God can bless me when I don't have the rent money. I wonder if God will heal me when I'm HIV positive. I wonder if he'll open up a door when I got no degree. But because you ain't talking about him, folk ain't thinking about him, and therefore are not believing in him. There, there, there were two men, two blind men who were sitting by the roadside. Watch this. And they heard that Jesus was passing by. Watch this. They heard what the 21st century church never preaches. They heard, watch this, Jesus is coming. Oh, God. Did y'all hear what I just said? Uh, they, are, they are sitting by the roadside and do not have the gift of sight. But they hear Jesus is coming. And when they hear Jesus is coming, watch this, there is no choir, there is no praise team. When they hear Jesus is coming, it demands a shout out of them. God help me. They begin shouting, Son of David, have mercy on me. See, some people are not shouting because they haven't heard Jesus is coming. Oh, you, you just keep hearing money's coming. But there's got to be a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow, every tongue must confess. What, what, what are you hearing that makes you call for him? What, what, what are you hearing that makes you believe that the sound of my voice has such authority? Here it is, that it will make God not just hear me, but respond. Uh, the Bible says that he's somewhere between Tyre and Sidon, and because he's right outside of that region, they keep crying out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Watch this, and the disciples are trying to make them be quiet. And the more they try to make them be quiet, the louder they scream. Watch this, because they have got to project their voice louder than their antagonists. My voice has got to be greater than the negative stuff that's coming at me. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Whatever is trying to limit, block me, reduce, or shrink me, I got to be louder than that. 
So the more they tell them to be quiet, the more they project their voice, son of David, have mercy on me. Now the Bible says it is a maddening crowd. And because it is a maddening crowd, watch this, Jesus can't see them for the crowd. He can't see them, but he hears the scream. And something happens, I need you all to watch this, something happens in that sacred text is that because they keep projecting Son of David, have mercy on me, something I had never read in any of the synoptic gospels is Jesus stood still. Oh my God, he responds to my sound. Can you imagine the sound of faith makes God stop? Oh, Jamal, you got to say that again. The sound of faith puts a mandate on heaven wherever it is that you go and stop right there. Can I give it to you in a contemporary gospel context? While of others thou art calling, please don't pass me by. All right, y'all are almost there. Everybody, you already got your word. Everybody on this side, what's your word, please? Come on, say it with a fire. Yeah, now, everybody on this side, would you give me your word, please? Come on, say it with authority, please. Now, listen, isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? I've got two contrary sounds. I got two contrary sounds in one room. One is telling you to go, and the other one is telling you to stop. And you got to figure out which sound am I going for? What, what, what am I responding to? It would be appropriate etiquette and protocol. Here it is that Jesus would have responded to the sound of the disciples. Yeah. Because the disciples are saying, stop. Yeah. It is the voice of the disobedient saying, go. It is the voice of the reprobate that is saying go. Listen to me, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. D did you pay attention uh, to the last miracle that Jesus performed before being crucified? The last miracle Jesus performed before being crucified, the Roman soldiers had come to arrest him uh, and they, he asked, do you think I'm some kind of common thief? This is almost slick Rick. Do you think I'm a common thief uh, that you are coming to arrest me uh, with swords and with shields? Watch this, and all I came to do was heal people. Watch what Peter does. Peter, watch this, uh, 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 pulls out his sword, pulls out his switchblade, and I need y'all to see what Peter does. Peter uh, chops off the lead police officer's ear. His name is Malchus. He chops off his ear, and the ear goes to the ground. Y'all stay with me. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but Peter pulls out a switchblade, watch this, and Chuck cocks off the ear of the lead police officer. Now watch what Jesus does. Jesus picks the ear up off the ground and places it back on the side of the soldier. Uh, now all this time, y'all been going to Easter programs in the fellowship hall of the church, and you didn't even understand why this is so important. Uh, the reason why this is so important is that it was against Roman law for you to assault an officer. All right, stay with me. If you assaulted an officer, all the more pulled out a weapon on an officer, you are, here it is, it is uh, zero tolerance, a mandatory minimum that if you assault an officer, you are to be crucified. So the moment he chops off the soldier's ear, the police officer should have shifted their attention off of Jesus and arrested Peter. Y'all ain't saying nothing. So in that moment, Peter should have died. So Jesus says, I know you were supposed to die, but I'm going to block you from death. Y'all ain't saying nothing by getting rid of what it is you did. Y'all don't know when to shout. Here's the real shout. So when he picks up the ear, and puts it back on the soldier's face. The soldiers could not take Peter to court. Watch this, because they got no evidence. You every now and again, you ought to be shouting because there's some stuff you should have died over, but God got rid of the evidence. I need somebody to give God glory that there's no evidence of what you did. No evidence of where you fell. Now what's 
this. A Fosdick would call this cheap grace. I need y'all to stay with me. This is cheap grace that he just picked up the ear. Watch this, put it back on the side of the soldier without the benefit of plastic surgery. It is as if nothing happened. God, I don't know who I'm talking to today, but some of you ought to be giving God glory that the healing that's getting ready to happen for you is going to be as if nothing happened. I can't find nobody in here. I'm telling you, they left you for dead. They cut you into pieces. But God said there'll be no strand of what took place because I am restoring you. He, he put back on him. He put back on him with the soldier chopped off because there is an absence of evidence. It's an absence of evidence, ladies and gentlemen. But the deeper understanding is that if they're coming to arrest Jesus, why would Peter not just cut off the soldier's hands? Cut off the soldier's hands because that's what you're going to use for handcuffs. How are your ears a threat? And why is that the focus of what you're going to cut off? Oh my God. Because Peter understood the graciousness of our Lord. Uh, he didn't want to run the risk of the soldier being redeemed. Oh my God. So if I cut off his capacity to hear, then he will not know, watch this, without an ear, he'll never hear, Father, forgive him. Huh. For they know not what they do. Without an ear, he would have no idea that Jesus was able to declare from the cross, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He says, I cannot, Peter, allow you to cut off this man's access to salvation. In spite of how he treated me, I still want him saved. God, I can't hear. See, that's a different level of maturity. When folk did you dirty, but you still want to see them all right. Y'all ain't saying that we ain't ever going to be together, but I want you to be all right. I, I need you still to have access to the kingdom. Says, I am, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm putting this on you because I, I, I want your access to hearing the voice of God to not be interrupted. 44% of those who are in AARP, 44% of those who are in AARP uh, say that they lost their hearing. It would impact their relationship. How there are those uh, specialists at Harvard Medical School uh, said it is easier, I want you to write this down, it is easier to come back from a stroke than come back from hearing loss. Johns Hopkins uh, University uh, says that uh, every other sense that you lose, you can navigate around, but hearing is the most dangerous. You can't hear a car coming. Can't hear your baby crying. Can't hear that there's a burglar in your house. You need hearing for your information. You need hearing for your protection. You need hearing for your understanding. But can you hear? And what are you listening to? Come on, Paul, give it to me. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Ah, man cannot live. This is what Jesus told the tempter, what he told Satan after 40 days of fasting. says, uh, uh, man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from uh, the mouth of God. I need to hear. Yeah, I gotta be able to hear. If every person uh, who's on this side, wish a word, please. Yeah, everybody on this side, wish a word. Yeah, y'all, y'all stop is kind of anemic. I, yeah, come on, I, I need that a little bit more forcible. Come on, give it to me. Thank you so very much. All right, so you got to understand, uh, bring me that chair for me real quick. You understand how faith is built, how we function our faith.
How we deal with faith is so critical that it sometimes goes beyond our hearing to our assuming. A lot of you are not operating in faith by hearing, you are doing it by assuming. And every day you function at a level of assuming without hearing. And so uh, I just brought, asked uh, one of our tech team uh, to bring me a chair, watch this. And uh, I never, in getting the chair, got the instructions on what was the weight capacity. I sat in this chair with no information, with no instruction, and no caution. I had faith it would hold me. Oh my God. Now, I have no relationship with this chair. Haven't been in this chair. I don't have one like it at home. But because I've been in a chair, I assumed it could do what the previous chair could do. Oh my God. So I sat in this chair, watch this, as an operation of faith without knowing the builder. All the more, I have no idea that this chair is from Ikea. If, if we assembled this chair right here at the church, God have mercy. <laughs> I don't even know if nails are missing uh, from it. I am believing, watch this, that it can do what it looks like. I also assume, watch this, it's got the same strength as the chair you sitting in. With no background, with no instruction, watch this, and nobody told me to do it. Who was I listening to that made me sit in a chair I did not know? Who was I listening to that gave me permission to sit in a chair by somebody I have never met. What gave me the confidence when I know I'm not responsible for this chair? I told myself to believe. I listened to myself. Here it is, with no experience. I listened to myself with no understanding. I listened to myself believing it was the right thing. And uh, I had to trust it. And I didn't know whether it worked until I got in it. You knowing you the way you know you, how do you still have faith in you and question the voice of God? How many times have you fallen through a folding chair? Knowing you had no business in it. Knowing that it did not have the weight to carry you. But you said, I'll, I'll trust it. I, um, I need, uh, real quick, the three of y'all from the praise team, green, pink, orange. Come on, quickly. Yes, thank you. Yeah, there you are. Yeah, S stand right there. Yeah, facing me. The three of you, right there. Uh, young lady in the yellow, can you come to me real quick? Yes, thank you so very much. Dredge, come get this chair for me. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Stand right here. I'm coming. Thank you. Uh, Sailor Robbie Stokes, come on, help me real quick. Thank you. All right. How you doing? Good. How long you been going here? Off and on since 2004. She, she, she giving herself away. Yeah. yeah. You been here the whole time I've been here? The whole time? Yes. You watched me online before I ever got here. Yeah. Then you came back. Yes. I got it. So you was watching me when I was in Baltimore. Yeah. So you know my voice. Yeah. So you knew my voice before I got close. But based off of my voice from afar, you said when it gets close, I'm a follower. Yes, yeah, all right. So it's, it's, it's I'm trying to show you something. Yeah. Right. So when I'm asking you, you trust me as your pastor. 
Okay. So this is what you have to do is that if I am a pastor, your pastor, the Bible says, watch this, my sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. Watch this. They know my voice. And you will not know what is the vision if you don't know my voice. Yeah. And so if uh, you have leadership, then you got to be able to trust your leadership and the voice of your leadership. All right. All right. You trust your pastor's voice? Okay. Thank you. I trust you to follow my voice. Yeah. So I trust you to do. I want you to put this on. Yeah, put that on for me, please. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. Can you see anything? All right, let's go back two steps. Yeah, stay right there. You got my voice. Yeah, thank you. Everybody here, would you just give me your word, please? Yeah. Yeah, now at the same time. Yeah. Now watch this. I'm going to be directing you like a choir. be directing you like a choir and uh, when I give you direction I want you to give your word and I want you to keep giving your word until I stop you from giving your word all right tell me your name Tasha, Tasha. thank you so much all right y'all just start walking past her thank you just start walking past her thank you Tasha spin around three times thank you yeah come on yeah. Listen, listen, Tasha, I'm going to give you directions. I'm going to give you directions. Y'all just keep walking past her. I'm going to keep giving you directions, and you're going to have to stay focused on my voice. Because when you have the voice in your life, you have to block out what's going on around you. When you have a voice in your life, you cannot... Uh, you cannot be dissuaded by all of the distractions. Here it is. The Bible says something I want you to be mindful of. We walk by what? And not by what? Yes. All right. Uh, and so, Tasha, I'm going to give you directions, and your responsibility uh, is to follow it. And know that while I'm giving you directions, you're going to hear different voices. And your responsibility is to ignore the different voices and follow the voice that is leading you, even when you can't see that voice. Hallelujah. I'm going to get you to your desired end. I'm going to get you to where it is that you're supposed to be. Bring me one of those, please. Thank you. I'm going to get you to where it is that you're supposed to be, uh, but it may take you a moment for you to get to where it is that you're supposed to be, even when you feel lost, even when you feel dizzy, even when you feel like you're in it by yourself. Your responsibility is to follow the voice that is called over your life. Ladies and gentlemen, do me a favor, please. Come on. Yes. Listen. Thank you. All right. Tasha, come on. Walk straight. Turn around, please. Walk straight. Turn around, please. Walk straight. Keep walking. Keep walking. Turn around. Keep turning. Keep turning. Keep turning. Keep turning. Stop. Walk. Turn. Turn. Stop. Walk straight, please. Walk straight. Walk straight. Stop. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. Stop right there. We walk by faith and not by sight. When you are feeling lost, when you have no direction, when you can't even trust yourself, when you're unsure of where you are going and what is happening next, the voice of God will put you in a test. How much do you trust me? 
Do you believe that I can speak those things that are not as though they already are? Do you believe that I can create something out of nothing, even when you believe that nothing else was there? I go away to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions, and in it there's a room with your name on it. I hope you realize that God has already created something with you in mind, but he had to navigate your entire life to see, will you trust my voice? when I'm leading you where you've never been before. Abram, I need you to leave your land and go where you got no family, where you got no friends, but I need you to trust where I am taking you is better than where you ever been in your life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The voice over your life can see what you cannot see, has planned what you could not orchestrate, has plotted what you never had in mind, has strategically moved some things around so that you would be in his divine will. The story is told about a young boy, his house caught on fire. He was home alone and didn't know what to do. And he climbed up to the roof of his house. His father drove up, saw all of the fire trucks, and the boy was on the roof. And the fireman kept trying to make him jump, but he wouldn't do it. The father stood at the bottom of the house and said, Timmy, can you hear me? Timmy said, Daddy, is that you? He said, yeah, that's me. He said, Timmy, I need you to jump. The roof is about to cave in. The whole house is on fire. And Timmy, with tears coming down his eyes, said, Daddy, I'm scared. He says, I know you're scared, but I'm going to catch you. All I need you to do is jump. It's going to save your life. He says, Daddy, I'm scared because the smoke is so thick. The flames are so high. And I don't know whether I can make it if I can jump. He said, Timmy, you can make it. You just got to trust me. And Timmy said something that really is the sum total of our faith. Timmy said, Dad, I can't see you. And his father says, I know, but I can see you. And as long as I can see you, I can catch you. Ladies and gentlemen, when you move by faith, It'll feel like the whole house is on fire. You're choking on the fumes of your own mistakes. You can't even breathe because of the scars of your past. But the Father's saying, I see you. Watch this. Even in the moment you can't see me, I still see who it is that you are. I see where you are. And I needed you to take a jump that would change your life. Tasha, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Believing by faith is something amazing that's getting ready to happen in your life. But you don't even know what you stepped into. You don't even know what God is getting ready to do. You don't even know how he's getting ready to fix it. But everything that you went through in your life was setting you up to follow the voice of faith, to know your next move is gonna shift something for somebody who ain't even in this room. Your next move is gonna make somebody believe God like they've never done before. The next move is gonna block somebody from jumping out the window to soaring off the roof. Tasha, if you can hear my voice and you trust that God has something already planned for your life, You've been spun around. You've been bumped into. You've been made to feel dizzy. Feel uneasy, almost embarrassed. But God says, if you can hear my voice, I need you to trust me by faith. Tasha, if you can hear my voice, I want you to sit down right where it is that you are. Sit down right where it is that you are. 
Get back up. It, that required no faith. I want you to understand that God has something prepared for you. We quote it, but we don't even mean it. That eyes have not seen. That ears have not heard. All of you, come on. God's getting ready to use the people that bumped into you. To prepare a place for you. Every person who's in this room, I'm going to say something you done heard it your whole life in church. But I need to say it to you differently. Would you lift up that hand? I'm finished. My time is up. I want to say it to you. I'm saying it to you, but I'm really speaking it over Tasha. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the throne of grace. May God rest. May God rule. May God abide with you. Tasha, if you'll be seated right where it is that you are. You keep trying to go back to the floor. <laughs> Listen to me. Listen, it wasn't even what I planned. I didn't talk to Tasha before this. But how many people miss your assigned seat? Going back to the floor. God help me. How many of us assume a lower level when God has already prepared an elevated place? I speak over your life tonight that you are not going to miss your reservation. God has already made a seat for you at the table. I'm telling you, God has already prepared what people tried to block you out of. Hallelujah. I bind everything in you that assumes you should be on the floor. I thank you, Holy God. I thank you, Holy God. I thank you, Holy God. That when nothing else would help, it was your love that lifted me. Those of you that are surrounding her, take that off of her because she's getting ready to see life differently now. She's getting ready to see her future differently now. Listen, two things I want to show you in our clothes. The chair I was in is not the chair she was in. Listen, what you see other people in is not what God prepared. And you're going to keep missing your blessing dealing with the demon of compared expectation. Secondly, secondly, I need you to see, not only is she in a different chair, but her chair is in a different place. What God is setting you up for may not be in the position you assumed for yourself but it is still going to be in your safe place. I need you to notice something lastly, that none of the people who are surrounding her that were going in contrary directions, nobody on this stage moved the chain. She assumed there was none. A lot of what it is that we do, we are ascribing blame for enemies that have not been assigned. Nobody moved your chain. Nobody moved your position. You went back to your lowest level because that's where you assumed you were supposed to go back to be. But I loose the hold of every satanic principality that you will stand in the gift that you're supposed to be in. Those of you who are inclining your ear towards God, would you give God your best praise now? Thank you so much. I said, would you give God your best praise right now? Come on. I said, would you give God your best praise? I want everybody standing. I'm opening the doors of the church. I think it is interesting to know that the temptation of man, the entrance of the serpent into the Garden of Eden. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent to him. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord.
Would you arm yourself with a writing instrument? There are some principles and points uh, that I want to share with you that I believe will serve you well long after this day is over. I want to preach for a little while today. Um, I never got what I was promised. I never got what I was promised. Would you look at the person beside you and ask them, do you know what that feels like? never got what I was promised. The erudite African-American academician from Harvard University named Henry Louis Gates wrote an article for the online periodical entitled The Root, The Truth Behind 40 Acres and a Mule. And in it, he unpacked how the promise was the first systematic attempt to provide a form of reparations to newly freed slaves. If that same body of legislation was introduced today, the radical waves of its implications would be seismic. It's called for the government to confiscate 400,000 acres a privately owned property of the Confederates to be redistributed to former slaves. The final section of the order prescribed that each family shall have a plot of land of not more than 40 acres of tillable ground and the military authorities will afford them protection until such time that they can protect themselves. What's critical is the mandate was not just for us to receive 40 acres, but 40 acres of land that is tillable, meaning you got to give them something to work with. If the land is not workable, it's not worth it. And I'm believing for all of you who are in this room that God is going to give you something to work with. Did you hear what I just said? I said God is going to give you something to work with. The extension of that order is not just 40 acres of tillable ground, but that it would, in fact, through militaristic oversight, be protected. I want your productivity to be protected. That nobody will be able to mess up what you've been working on. Thousands started moving towards the coastline, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia. They started moving there in expectation of the manifestation of that which had been promised. But Andrew Johnson, who was Lincoln's successor, and a sympathizer of the South, despised blacks so much that he overturned the ruling and gave the land back to the very people who declared war on the United States. And all these years later, statues are standing to hallmark and honor the people who didn't want you to have your promise. What's astonishingly, astonishingly appalling is the fact that they weren't doing us a favor, but it was to make amends for the years of free labor, inhumane treatment, and the onslaught of trauma. Regrettably, this practice wasn't left in the 1800s, but has weaseled its way to contemporary times. There's no accurate data for the number of employees who were insured an increase, a raise that never came. It places you, I want you to hear my heart, it places you in a predicament as to whether or not you should quit. 
He promised you the raise, the increase, the bonus, and you never got it. And now you're placed in the awkward position as to whether or not you should remind them what they promised you. And you end up getting offended because they never gave you what they promised. And then they turn around and add to your workload. But it's not just with employment. It seeps into agreements with your spouse or even alone to a friend. It lingers in your mind because it's not just about getting paid as some would perceive, but it's on the principle. And the question that you've got to ask yourself, even in this moment, is why is it, Pastor, that um, I am wrestling with guilt about getting what I'm entitled to? Not doing me a favor. I'm not asking for anything extra. But I now am placed in a position of feeling uncomfortable for what I'm supposed to have. Y'all ain't never been there. And in 1 Samuel, long before David was to become king, while still in his early teens, his father sent him while being a shepherd to young sheep and told him to deliver sandwiches to his brothers who were on the battlefield being taunted by an imposing giant. I gotta stop right here because you don't even understand the implication or the ramification. That David is out tending sheep. His father has sent for him to deliver sandwiches. The reason why you don't understand the gravity of this assignment is David has already been anointed. He's been anointed, you missed this, and is still out there with sheep. He's anointed and he's sent back to the job he had before he got the anointing. And now with the anointing, he's at the old job. And then when the father calls on him, He's assuming this now is for the elevation that matches my anointing. The father calls him and does not pull him into a place of manifestation, but drags him to a place of further degradation. With all that anointing, David, go drop off sandwiches. Oh, Y'all ain't getting this. So now he's got to go out to his brothers, serve them, none of whom have his anointing. He's got to humble himself and serve people who don't have his anointing, and I hope you can get the picture, and wanted his anointing. In chapter 17, while standing in the trenches, and hearing this giant by the name of Goliath standing at nine feet, nine inches, David inquired of the people around him, because all he's doing is dropping off sandwiches. He asked, what is the reward for killing that giant? I want to know what that reward is. Y'all ain't going to like it because I've got no reward for being anointed. So because I got nothing for my anointing, what will I get if I wipe out this giant? And I, I, I want to free just 19 of you who are in this room. Um, David was asking uh, in no uncertain HR terms. <laughs> I, I, I want to know what my benefit package is. I, I, I want to know 
what I am getting into? What am I signing up for? Because I'm putting my life on the line. He asked, what do I get for this? 19 of you, I'm telling you, you better high five me in the spirit. Uh, because God told me to tell you, after this day, do not be casual about your compensation. Uh, yeah, yeah, you just missed what I just said. I said, do not be casual about your compensation and don't feel uncomfortable about what you require. Whether it's, hear this, whether it's an employment or relationship. What am I getting out of this? If they are offended by the question, they don't know your value. If they don't know how to deal with you being straightforward, it's because they anticipated you being in the back. That's where I was before I came to myself. But as of this moment, before I do anything, what am I going to be compensated with? And, uh, and in verse 25 of the same passage, Watch what it says. Uh, it says, watch this. Uh, the king will give wealth to the man who kills Goliath. That ain't it. You also get to marry the king's daughter. That ain't all. If you kill the giant, nobody in your family will ever have to pay taxes again. They had to incentivize the assignment because the assignment was so big. God, I don't even know why y'all are here this morning. Um, can, can, can I just talk to the 19 who I'm talking to? The thing that is in front of you is so big that there is no way God is going to expect you to tackle it without hooking you up. Oh God, I can't. You, you ain't against something small. You are dealing with something that mere mortals would never think about fighting. But because you got courage, heart, and confidence in the king, God says, I need you to know if you confront this big demon facing you right now, I need you to know I'm going to handle whatever it is that you need because you've been faithful. Y'all don't know how to worship over your promise. He says, I'm going to bless you. Here's your shout with compensation. I'm going to bless you on the 90. Y'all ought to shout with companionship. I'm going to bless you, watch this, with a corporate entitlement that because of the victory on you, the people related to you are going to have an easier way of life. And you mean you don't want God to do that for you? I'm going to speak that for myself if you don't want it. God said if you handle this big thing, I'm telling you the thing you're facing right now. He said if you handle it, I'm telling you I'm going to take care of you with compensation, with companionship, and with corporate entitlement. And those of you that believe God for all three of them, will you give God glory now? What's whispered? What's whispered but never discussed is the fact that we are wired with a desire for honor and reward. Ram Bullock is getting ready to get difficult right through here. Uh, the two disciples asked Jesus, which one of us will sit at your right hand? Okay. And I, I, I want to free somebody in the room. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm getting ready to free somebody. Uh, stop apologizing for ambition. Those who are not trying to go anywhere will usually stay there. 
When you are anointed, there is something in you that wants more. And people that have no vision, who have no passion, and have no purpose, will always want you to stay stuck. But God said, after this moment, those that don't want to roll with you are going to get rolled over on. Go forth with the assignment that I have given you and stop apologizing because you want more for your life. Without any experience, David had never fought a giant. Without any experience, watch this, he had confidence in his ability. I think I lost you. He has confident, confidence in his ability with no experience. I know I can do it even though I ain't never done it. <laughs> Did y'all hear what I just said? I know I can do it even though I have never done it. That's why the enemy can't stand me is no matter what position I've been thrown into, I've got an instinct for survival and I'll find a way even if there ain't no way. I had nobody give me the secret sauce. I just figured out that God will give me wisdom on my feet and give me an understanding for stuff I got no training in. And if he did it before, I'm a living witness. He'll do it again. If you don't know your word, If you don't know your worth, don't expect other people to calculate it accurately. You don't know how to pay me. Oh God, I can't hear nobody. You don't know how to pay me because you don't know how to calculate the measure and the standard of the anointing that rests on my life. But God told me to tell you that in this season of your life, I am locking doors to where you are tolerated. And I am opening doors to where you will be celebrated. You have got to walk into a place where you can say with authority, here's your shout, I deserve this. I don't feel bad about it. I'm not apologizing for it. I deserve it. Be seated, please. Hallelujah. I'm tired of saints having fake humility. Oh God, I can't hear nobody. I, I need somebody to shout out loud, I deserve this for the sacrifices I made, for the stuff that I had to give up, for the days that I went without, for the work that wasn't even mine. I deserve this for how I suffered in private, how I had to deal with shame and embarrassment, when I had to go without and refuse to ask for help. I deserve this when nobody saw me at the bottom, but everybody wanted to be close to me when I'm rising to the top. I deserve. No. Huh. I just need 90 of you to shout out loud. I deserve it. I deserve it. And unfortunately, was never touched upon in scripture, in Sunday school, in church, in your devotion, and even by authors, biblicists, theologians. What nobody has ever delved into is the fact that all of us in this room know that David killed Goliath it never dawned on you that David never got what he was promised. He 
he defeated the biggest enemy there was. God help me. And Saul never gave him untold wealth and resources. He, he, he never got the firstborn daughter to be his wife. He, he, he did do the assignment. We got record of that. And in spite of doing what he was supposed to do, the family still had to pay taxes. I'm, I feel like I'm preaching to some people who are in this room, who are in this tug of war. Because you did what you were supposed to do. Oh God, y'all mean it. There ain't going to be too many people shouting right through here. Nine of y'all that just want to cry right now because cause you've been trying to figure out what did I do wrong? I, I, I dotted my eyes. I crossed my T's. I, I treated people fair. I did business. I looked them in the eye. I met all of the requirements. And still, in spite of what I did, I still didn't receive what I was promised. I, I, I realize that this is unorthodox. It's countercultural to the charismatic experience because most times in church we, we just shout on the promises of God. But, but, but this is for those who never got it. Y'all ain't gonna say nothing to me. I, 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 I get it. Just, just blink at me through Morse code. I'm, I'm talking to three of you that still uh, got, got a rough time dealing with God because you thought he promised you that he was gonna heal your mama. Y'all still ain't saying nothing. You, you trying to figure out because you knew, you knew that that promotion, that that job was yours and you got jumped over. Y'all ain't going to like this by somebody less qualified yeah. and you still can't figure out for the life of you how you did not get it. Somebody, I'll bid you for the house that you thought assuredly was going to be yours. In fact, uh, the intended fiance of uh, David, her name is Merab, M-E-R-A-B. And can I tell you how low down Saul was? David destroys Goliath and gives Merab to another man, watch this, on David's wedding day. He gives marrow to somebody else, watch this, who never fought Goliath, never went on the field. That, 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 that's what Saul did. He, he gave marrow away. And you thinking of it just in terms of a daughter. You don't even know what she looked like. Got no idea whether she's a brunette, whether she's blonde, got a natural. You don't know what it is. Marab is. But can, can, can I just tell you this? That Marab, watch this, um, uh, Marab in Hebrew translates to mean increase. But it's crazy, y'all. Marab has two different definitions. Marab means increase, but it also means manipulation. God help me. So he is promised to increase with manipulation. God help me. Uh, when it's time for increase, be on the lookout for people who use manipulation. God help me. Folk, folk will promise you all kind of stuff just to whet your appetite and then when it's time for them to deliver they'll move the cards around because they never had the intention of seeing you multiply somebody is demonically assigned to try to swindle you out of your increase 
God, I can't hear nobody. Some, somebody right now has a diabolical plot as to how they can separate you from what you are supposed to receive. Hallelujah. But my dear covenant brother Charles Jenkins uh, sings a song uh, that declares this means war. God help me. And, and after he said this means war, do you know what he tells the enemy? You can't have my family. Hallelujah. And do you know what he says right after you can't have my family? He says you can't have my increase. I thought y'all were gonna be able to get that right there. And that's what I came to tell the enemy. You can't have my family and you can't have my increase. Why? Because this means the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the just. Be seated, we got miles to go before we sleep. Sometimes your greatest test, sometimes your greatest test, sometimes your greatest test is to see how will you act when you don't get what you were promised. If I were to ask y'all on this Sunday morning, what you gonna do when you get everything you were promised? Y'all be running around the church, giving each other high five, screaming, preach black man. Uh, but that ain't the real test. The real test of your anointing is David had to write out, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Can I tell you why the enemy can't stand you? I didn't get what I was promised, but I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. The, the, the Chinese word, the Chinese word for crisis is a combination of two words danger and opportunity. A crisis, watch this, is a danger and an opportunity. In every crisis, there's an opportunity. When you see an opportunity, no, you just survived a crisis. Y'all not hear what I'm saying this morning. God told me to tell you, watch this, I know you're going through something. I know things look dark and difficult and daunting, but God said, I needed you to go through a crisis just so I could have an opportunity just to show myself strong. This battle is not yours, but this battle is the Lord's. And I'm talking to somebody that's in a cold blue right now. You, you in a 911 situation. I just came to tell you, stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. Is there anybody here that's got witness testimony that he may not come when you want him to come, but he is an on-time God? Hallelujah. Be seated, please, for the last time. Hallelujah. David, he, um, he killed Goliath and never got wealth from Saul. Never got the firstborn daughter. And his family, watch this, never got their tax exempt status. But when you got time tonight, I want you to read First Chronicles. And in 1 Chronicles, we discover that David made a generous gift to the temple. God help me, the Bible gives a record that he gave more than anybody else. He gave more than everybody else. Watch this, which made him the largest giver. I'm scratching my head trying to figure out where did he get the money from. 
Hallelujah. If Saul never gave what he promised. And he said, Jamal, when you get to 730 service, tell them I wouldn't let Saul give David what he promised. Because then he would feel like he got to work for Saul. But when the heavens had started opening up and he got everything that he needed, he had to declare, my God shall supply all of my needs. Y'all didn't come to have church today. Would you look at your neighbor and say, I didn't get what people promised me. But whatever God promised me is on the way. Good evening, church. May the Lord bless you real good. But is there anybody here that knows can't nobody do me like Jesus and can't nobody do me like the Lord? The Lord said to Noah, build an ark because there's going to be a flood. There had never been rain in that area. And so he gathered his family together and said, the Lord said build the ark because there's gonna be a flood the wife looked at channel two for the seven day forecast and it said bright sign every day the sons went on google and looked for a weather alert and it said clear sky she said i know what the report says but god said that i'm a build the ark and it's got a People in town started laughing at him. His co workers started pointing their finger at him. They looked at the sky, and it was a bright, sunshiny day. As a matter of fact, it took years before it came to pass. It's just sitting there on stilts in a dry desert ground. But one day, with Without any warning, drip, drip, drop, drip, drip, drop, drip, drip, drop. God told me to tell you whose report will you believe? Jehovah has the final say. Y'all didn't come to have church. Whatever he promised you, 